The personnel of the SCP Foundation are proud, highly trained professionals. They are selected from the best of the best from universities and militaries across the world. The researchers, agents, and soldiers that do the daily work of securing, containing, and protecting the world from anomalies take their duties very seriously. When the fate of millions potentially relies on your daily decision-making, things can be a little intense, to say the least. Kind of makes you want to take back that old Uber-driving gig now, doesn't it? But with the massive amounts of personnel the Foundation hires, it's inevitable that not every employee lives up to this high standard. In fact, sometimes they purposefully subvert the standard. Whether it be for personal gain, power, or something else entirely, the consequences of exploiting their position is often dangerous. SCP-321 is living, if you can call it that, evidence of one such incident. The file itself is heavily classified. In fact, it's been personally redacted by O5-12, one of the 13 mysterious overseers that control the day-to-day -day operations of the Foundation. As for why, that will eventually become clear. In fact, it's so heavily classified and hidden from main Foundation servers that it isn't even possible to show it here in its full state. But that doesn't matter anyway, because SCP-321 isn't the kind of thing you can read. It's so visceral, you need to see it to believe it. So put on your lab coat and get your clearance guard. We're going down into the bowels of Site-04 to find out just what this strange anomaly is that an overseer is so insistent on hiding it from the world. Imagine you've been working at the Foundation for several years. You've seen all the famous anomalies, you've taken tissue samples from SCP-682, you've conducted material tests with SCP-914, and you even interviewed SCP-049. All the other researchers have shown you the ropes, but you've more than surpassed them. Your superiors have taken notice that you have a good, clean track record with intelligent and humanoid anomalies. You've recently been promoted from junior researcher to a full-fledged foundation researcher, and your clearance class has gone up. You can now access files for most anomalies in the course of your duties. But working at the SCP Foundation isn't all fun and games. There's a whole lot of paperwork to fill out. Paperwork for tests, paperwork for new anomalies, paperwork for every little containment update, whether it be a dietary change or completely altering an anomaly's containment method. You've spent long, long hours between meetings or tests in your office at your Foundation issue terminal, poring over SCP files and documents to print out or put together briefings on. During one of these late-night work sessions, having gone down a rabbit hole into SCPs filed under reanimation and humanoid tags, you encounter a hyperlink to the file for SCP-321. Mildly intrigued at the memorable number, you click it, only to be caught off guard entirely when your terminal freezes up. The screen locks up, and a single message flashes on the screen. Unauthorized access. Automatically shutting down. The machine reboots itself and seems fine, but you're startled by the experience. Though obviously it's not unheard of, sometimes documents in the Foundation are just locked up and people forget to make a note of it. This SCP-321 must be just another file, nothing to worry about. You know that, but that doesn't stop you from sleeping with the lights on in your dormitory that night. The next morning when you report the incident to your supervisor, she seems disinterested. She assures you that it was just a minor unauthorized access hiccup. It happens all the time within the database. But when she asks you what file it was out of curiosity, and you respond with the number SCP-321, well, her response is... odd. She quietly writes something down, muttering something about Adam, and curtly dismisses you to get back to work. It is a curious mystery, but it stays a mystery, and you don't hear about SCP-321 again for a long time. It's years later. You've participated in hundreds more research inquiries and thousands of tests and experiments since. Your skill with anomalies is pretty notable in Site-04 now, and you stand out in a crowd. Your position rises appropriately. Congratulations, you've made senior researcher. Very few ever get to this position, much less at your age. You supervise research over dozens of anomalies and over a hundred staff. Though you don't do much testing with your own hands anymore, it's too risky to send senior researchers in for grunt work, and your role is mostly one of oversight and supervising. So when you receive an email one late night on your terminal for containment procedures of some anomaly you've never heard of, you're not too surprised. 
but when you read the subject line, that changes. SCP-321, the same mysterious anomaly that nearly bricked your terminal when you were just a researcher. You're now about to find out what was so secret that it needed to be restricted so heavily. You click the email, holding your breath, and find nothing. No description of the anomaly, no addendums, and certainly no images or supplements. Just a partially filled out SCP document. Item number 3890, object class, safe. All that's there is a sparse set of containment procedures. SCP-321 is to be kept in a regulation containment chamber. SCP-321 has been outfitted with extensive braces to make up for weaknesses in bone structure and muscle mass. Its artificial heart is to be examined once a month for any damage. SCP-321 is to be fed three times daily. Solid foods are excluded from its prescribed diet. Three staff members are on temporary SCP-321 assignment at this time. SCP-321 is to be given three hours a day of exercise and physical therapy, with the rest of its time not involved in experiments to be confined to its cell. While SCP-321 is incapable of asking for anything, it has been allowed several stuffed toys. Very, very strange. It seems to be some kind of humanoid anomaly, but it's not clear whether it's sentient or not. It also seems remarkably fragile, with all sorts of medical shunts and splints to counteract extensive calcium deficiency in the bones and atrophied muscles. And an artificial heart? Lots of resources are being spent on keeping this thing, whatever it is, alive. But what kind of life does it live, not even being able to eat properly and needing constant physical therapy between experiments? The stuffed animal thing is even more haunting. Stuffed animals are something the Foundation tends to reserve for child anomalies, and why can't it request anything? All you can conclude is that the Foundation is, for whatever reason, keeping a fragile, mute child in the maximum security wing of Site-04 and not letting anyone know about it. It's not a pleasant thought, but you know that these things aren't done for no reason. Whatever this anomaly is, it likely poses a danger to itself or people around it and needs this level of security. You approve the containment procedures, close your email, and go to sleep. And once again, that's all you hear of SCP-321, whatever it is, for a very long time. Site Director is an incredibly prestigious position in the Foundation. These Titans manage massive Foundation installations and facilities. They're the executives, the big shots, the decision makers, where the buck stops. Some maintain the researcher roots they came from, and others fall fully into the role of power player in the Foundation's complicated internal politics. Either way, it's a very high level of power most people never get anywhere near. When you made assistant site director, you know it's not the real thing and that getting up there is still a few years off. But that doesn't stop you from feeling incredibly proud of how far you've come in your career at the Foundation, how many breaches you've stopped, and lives you've saved by keeping dangerous anomalies locked up. You can access the full database file on nearly every SCP in the site's catalog now. It doesn't take long before you think back to the strange anomaly that had repeatedly cropped up in your career and decide to now bury the mystery. You check in with your credentials and navigate to the SCP-321 file to see what's what. It's just your luck that the database file is completely empty. All that's there are the same containment procedures you authorized so many years ago, and a short message from Raysa that the SCP-321 file hasn't been digitized yet, and that a physical copy is available in SCP-321's containment chamber. Strange, but at least now you have somewhere to go. SCP-321's chamber is deep, deep below Site-04. It takes you three elevators and security checkpoints to even get down there. This is where the top secret anomalies are kept, not necessarily dangerous, but the things the Foundation would prefer not to get out to even their own employees. It's a dark hallway lined with steel doors. You find the right door and scan your card, and a guard waves you in. You're in an observation room of some kind, with one large window looking out into an adjoining containment chamber. There's computer screens all over the walls, displaying medical information and data. There's no one else in the room, but something is lying in the hospital bed in the containment chamber. There's a clipboard hanging from the wall, 
bearing the designation SCP-321. You pick it up and carry it with you as you enter the containment chamber and approach the hospital bed. SCP-321 lies in the bed. It's a long, distended-looking humanoid, almost 10 feet in length but incredibly thin and frail-looking. Its hair is thinning, and the skin is taut around its face, but you can discern some decidedly feminine-looking features. Its eyes are closed. The thing is asleep, and you give it a closer look as you cross-check it with its documentation. SCP-321 is a human female, born sometime in the 1800s. SCP-321 is currently 3.1 meters tall and weighs approximately 110 kilograms. Subject is devoid of melanins in hair, eyes, and skin. Yep, that checks out. The anomaly is white as a ghost. The document says that it can't speak and seems to have trouble with spatial recognition, intelligence, and awareness, like a child. Then, then it hits you. This thing must be from the 19th century. The next paragraph is redacted, but the one after that is fascinating. You look at it as you circle SCP-321's bed. It has complex regeneration abilities and is capable of healing injuries and wounds five times faster than a normal person. It ages incredibly slowly, which makes sense. It should be dead by now if it was born well over a century ago. It's noted down that its aging has stopped entirely, but it keeps growing taller and larger despite being already over 10 feet tall, well past the point where its heart should have given out. In fact, its heart did give out. Somewhere in the 20th century, it became too tall for its heart to properly circulate blood to it. This is the same condition that results in genetic giants dying so young. But SCP-321 was restrained by the Foundation to ensure blood kept flowing to its brain, though this was a losing battle. Its healing factor was unable to repair tissue damage happening constantly and in real time. Decay and necrosis began to set in to its muscles and organs. The Foundation stepped in. Just after World War II, a team of researchers began working to create a sort of artificial heart that would allow SCP-321 to keep on pumping blood. Not too unlike the modern pacemaker device, actually. It was finished some years later, and an expert-trained team of Foundation surgeons were tasked with implementing it. Since they successfully completed the operation, all of SCP-321's internal damage has healed perfectly. More tests revealed that its remarkably recuperative abilities came from an abundance of stem cells after exposure to an anomaly after… death. You look back up at the thing and back down. Is this a practical joke of some kind? You've seen stranger things than this, but still… a zombie? But it doesn't seem to be a zombie though it is undead. It's still human, at least apparently. It's been taught to eat and play with some toys, as well as exercise itself, though it took researchers years to train it to do so. They've also figured out that its vocal cords are intact, but for whatever reason it can't learn to speak, just crying and babbling like an infant. The remaining two paragraphs are under the subheader Origin, but they are again redacted in marker and attributed to the office of O5-12. For some reason, where this strange undead woman came from is a highly guarded secret that O5-12 doesn't want getting out. Very, very strange. But ultimately, this is all you can do for now. Obviously, this thing is eking out a pitiful existence down here. Who knows if it's even self-conscious, if it can feel pain. It's unfortunate and depressing, but after so many years in the upper echelons of the Foundation's research staff, you've seen some terrible, terrible things. This is very sad, but what can you do? The heart monitor in the room continues beeping as you hang up the clipboard in the observation room and take your leave. It really doesn't surprise anyone when you eventually become site director just a few short years later. You're given a warm welcome into the new job, but there's really no time to relax at all. Running a Foundation site is busy work, lots of meetings and important briefings to be had, which is how you find yourself heading to a meeting in the site with O5-12, one of the strange, mysterious O5s that rule the Foundation with an iron fist, subject to no one but the Ethics Committee. What could he possibly want with you? Not to mention the fact that this meeting is in none other than SCP-321's containment chamber. When you arrive, you catch a glimpse of him. He's an incredibly old-looking man, healthy but leaning on a cane. 
You make small talk for a moment before he starts talking about the anomaly lying in the hospital bed in front of you two. He explains that over a century ago, a Foundation junior researcher named Adam had developed a relationship with one of his colleagues, a doctor named Evelyn. The rules regarding relationships between co-workers were much looser then, and they married each other not long after. They even had a child together. At least, they were going to. Unfortunately, tragedy struck not long after Evelyn became pregnant. The infant didn't make it, and was stillborn. But Adam, unwilling to give up, began to conduct experiments on the corpse. Using SCP-590, another one of Adam's anomalous children named TJ, and a number of other SCPs, he somehow managed to bring what remained of his daughter back to life. Well, to something resembling life. But the Foundation quickly intervened when they discovered what Adam had created. They collected the creature and began to examine and experiment on her, which is when they discovered her amazing ability to heal from practically any wound. She was quickly classified as CP-321 and placed into containment for experimentation. But Adam was still a junior researcher at the Foundation, and he knew his daughter was undergoing cruel and invasive experimentation. He couldn't live with the guilt first of losing his wife, then his daughter. He made several formal requests for SCP-321 to be removed from SCP status on the basis that it was unnecessary. All were denied by the O5 Council. Years later, Adam had been promoted to personal director at Site-04. He again requested SCP-321 to be released from containment, and was again given a firm no. But a father's love never goes away. As he kept being promoted, he kept requesting his daughter be freed into his custody. When he became site director of Site-04, just as you had joined the Foundation, he made a statement declaring that there was nothing more the Foundation had to learn from SCP-321 and that it should be released. But again, nothing but denial. And when he was promoted to 05-12, he ordered that SCP-321 be released and returned to her family. That's right, 05-12. The old man standing beside you is the same man that fathered and created SCP-321 so many years ago. And that's not all either. His name is Adam Bright, father of notorious researcher Dr. Jack Bright, otherwise known as SCP-963. The Bright family's history is intertwined with that of the SCP Foundation, but despite all their power, they cannot get one of their own released from the Foundation's cells. When 05-12 made the decree, 05-1 addressed him personally. He was told that SCP-321 was not his daughter, if she ever had been, and that if he requested her release again, he would be dismissed from the O5 Council. Since then, all he has been able to do is visit his little girl deep beneath Site-04 and protect her from further experimentation. He explains that he hides and classifies her existence so heavily to make sure no one tries to perform more tests and take advantage of her healing factor. That's why you were unable to access or even figure out what the anomaly was for so many years. All the two of you can do is stand next to the hospital bed. The history of the the SCP Foundation is a long and twisted one, especially considering the complex web of relationship between its employees. The extensive Bright family, headed by famous Jack Bright but containing many of his relatives, winds through the Foundation. When one of its members abuses their position, you've seen how terrible the results can be. As for SCP-321, some anomalies tragically can't be saved, and there's little the Foundation can do about that. Now go check out SCP Immortal Dr. Bright Explained and Dr. Bright for President SCP-4444 Bush vs. Gore for more on the fascinating intricacies of the infamous Dr. Jack Bright.